Hello guys, this is Paul McWhorter with TopTechBoy.com and we're here today with episode number 13 in our incredible new tutorial series where you're going to learn artificial intelligence or you're going to die trying. What I'm going to need you to do is pour yourself a nice strong cup of iced coffee. That would be straight up black coffee poured over ice, no sugar, no sweeteners, none needed. And as you're getting out your coffee, as always, I want to give a shout out to you guys who are helping me out over at Patreon. It is your support and your encouragement that keeps this great content coming. You guys that are not helping out yet, take a look in the description below. There is a link over to my Patreon account. Think about hopping on over there and hooking a brother up. But enough of this shameless self-promotion. Let's jump in and talk about what I am going to teach you today. Now, in the lessons, in the first 12 lessons leading up to today's lesson, we have just been setting the groundwork. We've been laying the foundation for you to be able to do artificial intelligence. And in today's lesson, we're going to, for the first time, actually dip our toe in the water and start doing a little bit of what might be considered artificial intelligence in that we are going to have a video stream and we're going to be looking for an object in the video stream and then we are going to track that object. And to introduce this concept, we're going to track on the easiest thing possible. And the easiest thing possible to track on is color. And so we're going to see if we can identify and track this yellow object. All right. And that is why last in last week's lesson, we spent so much time understanding the HSV color space because the easiest way to track on color is to track on its hue value. So let's go ahead without further ado and jump into this. I will need you to go over and I will need you to fire up the most excellent Visual Studio code. And then uh, when you do that, we are going to come over here and we are going to come to our Python working folder and we're going to click on the little plus icon by the sh uh, by the page and we are going to create the program open CV-17, I believe it is, dot .py and the dot .py is kind of important and boom, a fresh new Python program just waiting to be written. <clears throat> okay, I will get this out of your way so that the file explorer out of your way so you will have a little bit clearer view. And hey, I want to give, I don't remember the person's name, but somebody left me a comment in one of the earlier videos that there is an easier way to select your Python interpreter. I'll go ahead and get out of your way here. If you look at the bottom left of your Visual Studio uh, code, if you will just click on that, it will pop up what interpreters you have, and then you can just select on it. And remember, we created this virtual environment, 3.6.6 .6 in a virtual environment, and so that's the one that we want to use. But that is just kind of a cool thing that if you just click on that, it'll pop up your different uh, Python environments, and you can select the one. Neat little pro tip there. Thank you, the forgotten person, whoever it was that taught that to me. Okay, <clears throat> now also, uh, we don't want to start every program from scratch. So what I need you to do is let's call up that little program that just launches the webcam so we don't have to write the whole thing. So go to the most excellent www.toptechboy.com. If you come to this happy little search bar, you can search on the term you can search on the term faster launch of webcam. You'll come to this lesson. You see the code there. Click on the two little page icons, selects that for you. Right mouse click and copy. Now you've got the code. You come over here, right mouse click and paste. And just to make sure that we can copy and paste without breaking things, let's run this and see if it is going to work. And we get an error. And what it looks like is it is in line five. And what we can see here is that uh, when I wrote this code, it liked my webcam to be webcam one, but now for some reason it wants it to be webcam zero. So I will turn that to zero. If it crashes on one, try zero. If it crashes on zero, try one. I'm not exactly sure how it decides what the number of your webcam is, but let's try this again. 
and boom, there it is. Okay, now first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and make this smaller because no one wants to see my face that big. So I'm going to make it 640, which is half that much, and then 360. <clears throat> and now we should get a more reasonable size image. Okay, boom, that's really good. All right, so what is our goal today? Our goal is to analyze the frames and to find something that is this color, find this color, and then track it as it moves around. All right, the easiest way to do that, what did we say? We are going to track on color. We're going to track on color. And the most intuitive way to describe the color of this is it's got a red, green, blue, but we know that doesn't work at all because it's got a lot of red, it's got a lot of green, it's got a lot of blue. There's no intuitive way to track on RGB. But if we move to the HSV, the hue, saturation, and value, actually the color is very much described by the hue. <clears throat> And then, yeah, we'll use saturation and value, but it's mainly hue that defines what the color is and what the color looks like to you, okay, is hue. So if we're going to track on color, we need to create a little color box, and we need to be able to tell OpenCV, keep everything in the frame that's inside of this little box. This little range from a low hue to a high hue from a low saturation to a high saturation, and from a low value to a high value. Anything that is in that box, any pixel in that box we keep, and any pixel not in that box we are going to throw away. So in order to track on color, we've got to train OpenCV which color we want. And you could do that just by coming in right now and just typing in, well, I want to go from uh, you know, hue low to hue high, hue low is this much, hue high is that much. You could go in and just type in six numbers, but then you're going to be stopping and running and stopping and running the program trying to dial it in. What would be an easier way to dial in that little color box with what? I heard someone say track bars. Yes, we need to create track bars. How many track bars do we need to create? <clears throat> Hue, saturation, and value, each one is going to have a low and a high, so that will be six track bars that we need to create. Does that make sense? Then in real time, you can kind of train your model by dialing in those track bars until you are only seeing yellow. And we'll get more into that. But for right now, we need to jump in and we need to start defining those track bars. All right, so I am going to come down here after we've set up the camera, but before we've done anything else. And if we are going to make track bars, we're going to need to have a window. <clears throat> we're going to need to have a window to put those track bars in. So I'm going to do a CV2 dot named window uh, named window and this is going to be the window this is going to be the window for my track bars and so what are we going to call this i'm going to call this window my uh, tracker i'll call it my tracker that is what the window is going to be called and then we probably need to go ahead and move it so i'm going to say m move window and where am i going to move it well i'm going to move it off to the right of uh, of the frame, and so what? I, what do I want to move? Well, I want to move my. I want to move my tracker. Okay, and where do I want to move it? I want to move it over by the width of frame. Well, we've already defined width, and so I'll move it over by width, and I'll go down zero. And remember, right here we defined width, so it should know that. So sh this should give me my track bar window. Let's just go ahead and check that. Make sure it looks good. I like to run the program a little bit. Boom, there it is. Doesn't have any track bars in there because we haven't defined any track bars yet. <coughs> so that is what we should do now. So how do we create a track bar? Well, I'm going to do a CV2, CV2 dot create track bar. All right. And then what track bar do I want to create? I want to create a track bar for hue low. I want to create the hue low track bar. What window do I want to put it in? I want to put it in my tracker like that. And then what do I want the initial low value to be? Well, the initial value, it doesn't really matter. I'll make it 10. 
Okay, and then how far does that track bar go? Well, remember on hue, the hue values are zero to 179, so we need to make the track bar match that. So we want a maximum value on the track bar of 179. And then what do I do when somebody fiddles with that track bar? I have to call a function. I'm just going to call the function on track one. Now, have we defined on track one yet? No, we have not, but we'll come back later and do that. But let's go ahead. How many track bars are we going to need? We're going to need six. So I'm going to copy this one. I'm going to paste it five times, and then we'll go in and tweak it for what we want each track bar to do. So this will be control V. That's one, two, three, four, Five. So now we got six track bars. So hue low is going to uh, st start at 10, an initial value of 10, and go up to 179. And then the next one would be what? The next one would be hue high. And then if low was 10, well, let's have the initial high value be 20. Doesn't really matter. And this one, since it's hue, would also go to 179. But now this needs to call a different function. So we'll just call this on track two. We'll define these functions later on. Then if we have hue low and hue high, then we are going to have a sat low. The low value of saturation will be in my tracker. And remember on saturation, it goes from zero to 255. So the upper value of the track bar needs to be 255. Now remember all track bars start at zero. This 10 is not the low value, it is the start value. All track bars start at zero. So for sat low, we'll make that 10 just for fun. And that will then call our third function, which will be on track three. So if we have sat low, then we are also going to need sat high. We're going to put it in the window my tracker and the high value usually on sat i like a really large range because you know this the hue is very clear but the sat you know as i move it around it could have different levels of saturation so i'm going to say like from uh i'm going to have the initial high value i'm going to put it at 250 and we can tweak it with the track bar but this is just the initial value okay and then uh that would be a track bar four okay and then i have hue low hue high sat low sat high now i'm going to need hue saturation value so i'm going to need val low and that one similarly will go from zero to 255. Did you guys see my mistake here? I didn't make this one 255. So that's 255 on track four. And then the value low, again, I'm going to start it really low at 10. And the track bar will go to 255. And this is going to be track bar five. And then I'm going to have val high as my last track bar. So I'll have val high. And that will go in the window my track bar and this one will go uh it will i want it its initial value to be like 250 so again really wide saturation range <clears throat> really wide uh value range very narrow hue range if you look at how i've set it up and this will be track bar six and do you see that this also needs to be 255. okay so this should set up those six tracks bars well if i have six track bars i'm going to need what six functions and when you mess with the track bar it goes and it calls its function so what function do i need i need a on track one <clears throat> and i think i'll do that all the way up here so i'm going to say define on track one and when you monkey with the track bar, it's going to call all track one and it's going to pass it the value parameter, whatever the track bar is set to. So I got to put something there to catch that. So I'll just put the variable value. But now I will need a, a colon. But now also, you know that I want all the program that when this comes in as val, it's a local variable only known to this function. I want all functions. I want all the program to know what this number is. So I'm going to create a global variable, a global variable. And that global val uh, variable, I am going to call, what should I call that? I'm going to call it hue hue low like that okay hue low and then just for fun i'm going to print i'm going to print 
hue ah h u e low hue low okay and then i'm going to print hue low okay like that is it really that easy? No, it's not quite that easy. I made it a global variable, but now I got to tell it what it is. Hue low is equal to that val parameter that I passed in. Val is passed in. It's caught in val. It is a local variable. Then I make a global variable hue low that everyone in the world will know what it is. And then I set hue low equal to val. That should make sense. And then I print it. So let's run this thing. I think this actually will not run because I haven't defined these other ones. So yeah, I've got to come in. I've got to define them all before I run them. So they're all going to be very similar. So I'm just going to copy this. And I'm going to come down here and I'm going to paste it. That's one, two, three, four, five. So I'm going to create all my track bar callback functions. So I have on track one, this will be on track two. And this will be what? Not hue low. This will be what? Hue high. And then here, this will be hue high is equal to val and this will be then we will print hue high and we will print hue <clears throat> high okay so i've got on track one i've got on track two i need to do on track three and this is hue sat so this is going to be saturation sat low and then the variable sat low will be hooked uh, put to val and then this will be sat low and this will be sat low. Okay, look how fast this is going. Let's go to our function four, <clears throat> and this will be sat high. So we'll say sat high, and then we'll come down here, <clears throat> sat high like that, and then we will print sat high, and then we will print sat high okay sat high why does it not like sat high ah uppercase h there you go now everybody's happy okay this is a little tedious but we're getting really close to having this so now we are on track bar five and we have sat low sat high now <clears throat> we have val low <clears throat> for value low and then we put val low and then we print val low and we print val low okay and then this is going to be val high This is going to be val high. And we are almost done here, ladies and gentlemen. So this is going to be val high. Val high. Now, where are we? At this point, we should be able to get our parameter space of six parameters that will define that little box. <clears throat> that will lock on to this color. But before we try to lock onto it, let's just try to run it to get rid of the little typos before we miss, uh, move on. And usually I have little typos and I most certainly do here. On track six is not defined. Ah, I didn't make this a six. Hopefully you guys saw that there. That should fix it. Let's come back, kill this, come back. Okay, I've got track bars and uh, I've got them set to initial values. <clears throat> and now let me just move the track bars and look down here in this print. And as I move hue low, it should set it to something different. Yeah, you see as I'm sliding hue low, it's changing it. So I'll put it back at about 10. Okay, let's see if I can. Yeah, there it is. And then hue high, I can change. I can change sat low. I can change sat low. I can change sat high. Okay. Val low. I'm just making sure all these things work. Yeah, val high. Okay, that looks really good. So we are able, now we've defined this little box that we want to be in. 
Okay. Now this is the one little thing you have to think about. When we get down here to the main part of the program, the first time through the loop, we're going to be looking at the frame compared to those hue low, hue high, sat low, sat high, val low, val high. But the first time through, none of those callback functions have been called yet because we haven't touch the slider bars. So we need to set our initial values. And so we're going to do that right here. And so we are going to say we're going to give like hue low, hue low, and then ooh, that's hue low. And then we're going to need a hue high. And then we're going to need a sat low. And then we're going to need a sat high. And then we're going to need a val low and then we're going to need a val high like that now let's see our hue low i think we wanted that to be the initial value of 10 and then our hue high we wanted that to be an initial value of 20 and then our uh, sat low <clears throat> we are going to make that an initial value of 10 and then our sat high we said would be uh, like 250 and then our val low is going to be 10 and then our val high is going to be 250 and again those don't matter it's just the first time through you've got to have numbers there or the program will crash all right so that all looks pretty good now we're going to come down to the actual while loop and what we want to do is <clears throat> we grab the frame okay and then after grabbing the frame the first thing we want to do is we want to create a new frame in the hsv parameter space now what we in the hsv color space we don't want to erase frame because we're going to come back later and use it but we've got to grab an hsv version of that frame so how would we do that we would say well i'm going to create a new frame that i'm going to call frame hsv <clears throat> and that is going to be c equal to cv2 dot c VT color <clears throat> CVT color now what am I going to want to convert I'm going to want to convert frame and then how do I want to convert it with CV2 dot dot CVT or CV2 dot C O L O R in which one of these do I want to use I want to use BGR to HSV. So I'm going to take frame, which is BGR, and I'm going to convert it to HSV. Now I have a new frame that is in hues, <clears throat> saturation, and value parameters, uh, color space. Okay, now I want to create that little box. I want to create that little box of low values and high values. In that little box, I'm going to be looking at my whole frame for all the pixels that fit within that box. And so I've got to kind of, the easiest way to do that is to create two little arrays. One array is the low values and the next array is the high values. So I want an array that is low hue, low sat, low val. And then a second array is high uh, hue, high sat, high val. And then those will be kind of define the corners or the edges of my box. <clears throat> so I'll call the first array lower bound, okay, and we'll make that an array. And so we'll go np.array. So we're just creating a numpy array and I've got to tell it what it is. Well, it is going to be, it is going to be hue low, and then it is going to be sat low, and then it is going to be val low. All right, so I have a simple array with three numbers, <clears throat> the low value of hue, sat, and val. Okay, if I have a lower bound, you can imagine I am going to need a what? Upper bound, and that is going to be equal to np.array, and that is going to be what? And again, don't forget the square brackets inside the curly brackets because this is the array. And that is going to be hue high, and it is going to be sat high, and it is going to be val high. So I got an array with the low values, an array with high values. You see how it's giving me the squiggly under NP. It doesn't like that because, in fact, I have not yet imported NumPy. So I'm going to say import NumPy as in as NP, 
and now those should be happy down there. Okay, look at that, the NP is happy now. So I've got a lower bound and I have an upper bound. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is where the magic happens. I want to create a mask and a mask is going to be an array. And what I'm going to do is I am going to say my mask, it's gonna be a new picture and it's gonna be the same size as frame HSV Okay, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep CV2 dot in range. Okay, in range. And so what range, or first of all, what picture am I looking at? I'm looking at frame HSV. Okay, so I'm going to create a mask. I create the mask by looking at the picture frame HSV and I want to keep the pixels that are in range in what range Well, in the range between what lower bound and upper bound <clears throat> okay so let's look at this I'm creating a new array my mask that array is going to be formed by looking at the picture frame HSV and then it's going to keep all the pixels that are in the range between lower bound and upper bound. If the pixel, like as it's looking across, is if the pixel is between lower bound and upper bound, it's gonna turn the pixel white, like yes, we're in range. If the pixel is not between upper bound and lower bound, no, we're not in range, it's black. And so all the pixels are gonna be white or black. If the pixel is in the box that we described, it's gonna be white. If the pixel is not in the box, it's going to be black. Okay, so if it's in range, we flip the bit white. If it's not in range, we flip the bit black. And so this my mask is going to be a picture, but it's going to be a picture with black pixels and white pixels. All right, now I am going to be brave and I'm going to go ahead and try to show you the mask. Okay, I think that we can display it. So how would we display it? I would display it using I am show. Okay, I'm just going to do a simple CV2, CV2 dot I am show like that. What do I want to show? I want to show my mask. Okay, and then where do I want to show it? I want to show it as my mask, my mask <clears throat> like that. Okay, so I have a new window my mask where I'm going to show my mask. Now, mm, I think that I'm going to make it smaller because I've got the frame and then I want to put the mask down beneath it. But if I make the mask big, then I'm going to start filling my window up. So I'm going to do a CV2 dot resize. Okay. What do I want to resize this mask that I just created my mask? No, 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 no. I'm I need to say my mask small equal why did i give it a new name because i got to keep my mask because i haven't used my mask yet i got to keep my full size mask to use i'm just creating a copy of it that's smaller but i need to keep the original so i'm going to say my mask small is cv2 resize what do i want to resize my mask and then it wants the new dimension as a tuple so i need to have an open and close and now i need to put the new width and the new height inside the tuple and so i'm just going to make it half as big so i'm going to say width divided by two comma height divided by two now what is the danger with that well the danger is that this wants integers and if it's an odd number and you divide by two it's not going to be an integer so i need to force width divided by two to be an int open after the divide by two close so width divided by two might be a float int of width divided by two will be an int and same thing here int open the parentheses come over here close the parentheses so this closes the int this closes the tuple and this closes the cv2 dot resize so that should be right and now i should be able to show that so I'm going to come down here and say CV2 dot IM show. And what do I want to show? I want to show uh, the window. I'm going to call it 
my mask like that. And then what do I want to show my mask small? And that's just the small copy of my real mask. And if I do that, I better be good and move it so it doesn't end up behind the frame. So I'm going to say move window like that. What window do I want to move? I want to move the window, my mask. And then where do I want to move it? Well, I want to move it down. I want to move it over by zero. So it's going to move over by zero and it's going to move down by how much int int of height. And in that case, height is I'm not dividing by two. Height is already an int. So I just say height. OK, because that frame is height and I want the mass to be underneath it. So I just move the mass down by height. Does that make sense? I hope so. And I have a I have an error here there. All right. I think that should show it. I better take a big swig of this iced coffee. Because things are getting real, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so let's try this. Okay, we're going to run it. <clears throat> hey, what's the good news? The good news is it didn't crash. Okay, the good news is it didn't crash. Now, what is the mask? The mask is completely black, except for a few random pixels. Why is the mask completely black? The mask is completely black because nothing falls in that range. None of the pixels are between 10 and 20 in hue and between 10 and 250 in sat and between 10 and 250 in val. OK, now let's just say that I wanted to like, let's say I wanted to try to get my face. Well, my face is kind of red. So let's see if I could sort of zoom in on my face here. Well, I might be on the other side here for my face. Let's see if I can get it. OK, there do you see how now my face is kind of red and so it's sort of seeing red. The background is green. Let's see if I could dial in the background. OK, you see I'm looking for that green. OK, there. You see it found it and then I can kind of zoom in on it. And there you see now I've grabbed the green. But we didn't want to grab green or we didn't want to grab my face. We wanted to grab this thing. OK, and right now this thing is black. So the little thing we're trying to track is not in the box because it is tracking on green. OK, so how do we get that in the box? Well, if we come over here, we could just play. We could play around with the, with the hue value until we dialed it in. But where would we sort of expect it to be? If we come back to our OpenCV color wheel, you can see that yellow is between 0 and 45. And uh, my yellow here looks almost like it's tending towards orange. And I would say probably between 10 and 20. If I look at the color wheel, is where it is. So I'm just trying to see. We could do it by trial and error, but I think it's kind of neat to see a little bit about what we would expect. And so I'm going to come over here and try to put this between a 10 and a 20. And so I'll bring that down to about a 10. And then I'll bring the high about down to 20. OK. And so now if you look down here at the mask, the mask isn't finding anything. And if I put this up here, it's still not finding anything. So I need to try to dial in on this a little bit better. It's almost seeing it, but I'm going to widen this up a little bit, widen that up a little bit. OK, that is not seeing it. Let's bring this on up. Bring this on up. OK, there it is. You see, this is very, very saturated. So I need to bring the sat value all the way up. And now I'm going to try to tune this in to get the little random pixels around my hand out of there. OK, and so this is very this is very saturated. So I'm going to try to I'm going to try to zoom in a little bit on the saturated values. OK, so I'm bringing up the low end. You see some of those random pixels are going away. And then I'll bring this up a little bit. It's getting better and better. Now I'm going to try to tighten up on hue a little bit. And I tightened it too much. 
Okay, and now I'll bring this up. You see, I'm trying to make as small of a box as possible, and that is pretty darn good. Okay, do you see our mask now? What is our mask? Our mask is ignoring everything and only tracking our object of interest. So that is pretty cool, right? We are tracking, we have a mask that is tracking our object of interest. <clears throat> okay, but what we want is now we want a picture that ignores everything, but just shows us our object of interest. So we want like our object of interest against a black background. So how would we do that? Well, we come in, we've created our mask. We have created our mask, but we have not actually used our mask. Okay, so we need to come in now and we created the mask. Now we need to mask our original image. Now remember, I'm going to use my mask because it's the same size as frame. And so what I want is I want to create, uh, I want to create a new image, which is, <clears throat> I want to create a new image, which I will call my object, my object. And what is that going to be? That is going to be CV2. Okay, it's going to be CV2. And what I want is, uh, I want to say this very carefully, I want to do an and, okay? I want to take my frame and I want to, I want to take my frame and then I want to look at my mask. If my mask is a one or my mask is white, then I want to keep that pixel, that corresponding pixel of frame. If I want, if I look at my mask and the pixel is black, the corresponding pixel and frame I want to ignore. I want to make black. And so I want to do an and between my frame and my mask. And I would do that as cv2.bitwise underscore and. So that is going to do an and between my frame and my mask. And the output, the result, is, is going to show the frame, but only the pixels that have not been masked, if that makes sense. So what object am I going to look at? I'm looking at frame. Why frame? Not frame HSV, because I'm going back to my original image. I've already decided which pixels I want to keep. I used frame HSV to create the mask. Now that I have the mask, I go back and I apply it to the original image. For some strange reason that I do not understand, it wants you to tell you tell it the source twice. So it's frame, comma, frame. I don't know why. <clears throat> it's probably you would use two different images to do something fancier that I don't need to do right now, but I've never quite figured that out. <clears throat> Okay, and then I've got to tell it the mass. So I'm going to say mask is equal to what? My mask. My mask, like that. All right. Now that is my object. And I want to show my object. <clears throat> and so I am going to do a cv2 dot cv2 dot I am show. And what do I want to I am show? Uh, I want to show my object my object, my object, all right, <clears throat> and then that is going to be the frame, my object, and now I need to move it, so I'll say cv2.im show, and I want to move it over, uh, no, cv2. You know what I'm going to have to do? Remember, I've got the frame, and then I've got the track bar, so I really want to put the picture down below it. So I'm going to, I'm going to make it, I'm going to resize it. So I'm going to do a CV2 dot resize. So this will be smaller resize. What do I want to resize <clears throat> before I show my object? <clears throat> before I show my object, I want to resize my object. So my object small is going to be cv2 dot resize and then what do i want to resize i want to resize my object and then how do i want to resize it i think it wants a tuple okay and just like we did before did i uh 
Yeah. In fact, I want to do it just like this. So I can snag that resize rather than type all that in. Okay. And then I need an extra close. So this closes the int of height. This closes the tuple and this closes the function. So now I've got my object small and then I will show my object small. All right. Uh, and then I will uh, move it. So CV2 dot move window. And then what do I want to move my my object? And then where do I want to move it? Well, I want to move it over by, I want to move it over by int of width divided by two. And then I want to move it down by int height, not height divided by two because that frame is full size. So I move it down by height. Now this is the thing that's kind of confusing on this resize. It wants a tuple, which means open parentheses, the X comma Y close parentheses. But here in the move window, it just wants the X comma Y not as a tuple. Okay, so I'm going to show my object small and then I'm going to move it and then I'm going to show my mask. That is should not be there. So I might have had something showing underneath that other mask. If that was there before, that was kind of a mistake. But this might have some chance of working. Okay, look at that, right? Didn't crash. That's good news. Okay, so now <clears throat> here, here I am. I'm trying to point. Can you see that? Yeah, here I am. This is the mask, and then this is the masked frame. Okay, this is the mask original frame. So let's bring this up here, and you can see that it's almost trying to see it, and so I'm going to bring the saturation value on all the way up and uh, the value all the way up, the saturation all the way up, it's still not seeing it. Okay, bring this up some, bring this up some. What did we do before? Let's bring this on out. Okay, there it's seeing it. And now I'm going to bring up the low value a little bit. You see, I need to get my hand out of there. Okay, and I think I can do that with this. Do you see you just got to tweak it? Shazam! Who's your huckleberry? Look at this. Do you see this? We are tracking. Now, if you just look, if you just look at the mask image, you can see that it's ignoring everything except the object of interest. What is the object of interest? This is. I trained it to ignore everything but the object of interest. That is pretty cool, isn't it? Okay. Now, if you had a different color object, you could track on a different color object. So let's just <clears throat> play around with this. Let's see if we can grab the green screen and ignore everything except the green screen. Okay, so I'm trying to come up. Boom, I came up and now I have locked on to green. Now, if you look, uh, if you look right here and right here, you can see that I am not getting all of the green screen. So probably that value I need to bring down a little bit and the sat low, I need to bring down a little bit and the value low a little bit and boom, you see now I have the green screen. Now, why was that area a problem? If you look here, that is the shadow on the green screen and therefore it wasn't quite as saturated. So on my low saturated, I had to pull that down to bring it. Do you see what we're almost doing here? And in fact, I thought I would make this a homework assignment, but I'll just show you because I know that everyone could not really do this because you don't have a green screen. What would be neat? The whole thing with green screen is you want to get rid of the green screen and put something else in there. So I've got a mask that's almost doing what I want, but what do I want it to do? 
I want it to do the opposite, okay? So I'm going to come in here and quit. <clears throat> but I'm going to come in here after I create my mask. I'm going to say, I'm going to change it. I'm going to say my mask is equal to CV2 dot what? Bitwise, bitwise what? Not. Bitwise not of what? I want bitwise not of my mask. And so this is going to take my mask and it's going to turn the white black and the black white. So it's going to like select the inverse. And so if I dial in on green rather than that saying keep this, I'm saying whatever I dial in on reject. All right, so let's come in and look at that. Okay, and so now we got to come over and see if we can get that green screen out of there. Looking for green, looking for green. Okay, boom, there it is. And then, uh, okay, so you see now I've taken the green and I've eliminated it. Now do you see it would be very easy to put a still picture back there. You would need a picture that you read in that was the same size as the frame coming off the camera and then what would you do you would apply the original my mask right now i'm doing the knotted my mask you would ap apply the original my mask to the background image and you would apply this knotted mask to the camera image and then i would have a foreground image like right now this is the foreground image then that other one would be the background image and then you would all you would have to do is do a cv2 dot add and you could add your masked background to your mask foreground and the green screen would go away the green screen would go away and then what you would be left with would be you in front of the swimming pool or you on mars or whatever you wanted to do and that was going to be what i was going to give as a homework assignment but then i knew the hard thing would be that if you don't have a green screen it'd be kind of hard to do this so let's see let's see what else i need to show here is there anything else that I want to show you? I think I've shown you a pretty cool thing here. And let's, uh, I want to go back now. Now that we've done this knot thing, let's see what happens to our yellow if we try to track on yellow. So if I come down and start trying to zoom in on yellow, what's going to happen? kind of hard for me to think about this in reverse. Okay, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to ignore the yellow. Maybe I need to adjust this a little bit. Okay, there, that's pretty good. Okay, so do you see what I've done here is by using the knotted mask, now, like my object of interest, I am eliminating or I am, uh, I am erasing my object of interest. Now, I still, because I am obsessive compulsive, I've got a little bit around the outside, like one row of pixels that I'm not getting rid of there. Okay, that is pretty darn good. So you see, I take my object of interest and I make it disappear. Okay, and so then you could actually come in and you could use the original mask and you could put something else in here, like you could put something completely different in this area here. So you see, this is pretty interesting and pretty powerful. Okay, guys, so we have done our first, and let me kind of go back and let's go back to what our original objective was and so I'm going to take this knot out so I'm not going to knot my mask and then we're going to come back and we're going to find our object of interest and we know that we want to turn value all the way up we want to turn saturation all the way up <clears throat> and now I've got to dial in my yellow and that is pretty darn good okay do you see how I have my region of interest? And again, my hand's coming in, so I need to take these a little bit, and I think I'll get my hand out of there. 
And that looks pretty good. I think my hand is out of there. I'm getting the region of interest. It is looking good. What I am doing now is I am tracking this object based on color, which was our objective. So now what we need to do is we need to talk about your homework for uh, next time. And then also I want to talk about the, the mystery person contest from last week. So as far as your homework goes, there's kind of like two things that you might imagine. What if I wanted to track on two different objects? Like what if I wanted to track on a yellow object and a blue object? How, how would I go about tracking on a yellow and a blue object? Well, you can imagine that could be an issue. Uh, I mean, as we have it set up now, it would not do that. Also, sort of the other thing I want you to see is you got a little bit of a problem. So can you see that like to really get tracking this yellow, we found that a hue value between 10 and 27. And so the way you could look at it is it's sort of a slice of the pie, a slice from 10 up to 27 in hue. That is the slice that captures this completely very well. Okay, that is the slice that captures this very well. At least it did a minute ago. There it is. Okay, captures this very well. Well, you see, let me show you kind of what a problem is. If we come back to our OpenCV color wheel where hues go from, hues go from zero all the way around to 180, each increment rep represents two degrees. We go from zero to 180. You see, I could have a nice, I could have a nice green slice. I could have a nice blue slice. I could have a nice pink slice. I could have a nice aqua slice. But if I wanted a red slice, the problem is red. I'm having trouble getting oriented right. Red, red straddle zero. So you can see the kind of orangey red is above zero and the kind of pinky red is below zero, which would be like in the 170s. And so to really straddle for a red, I'm going to need what? I'm going to need two. Okay, I'm going to need two different color ranges that I track on at the same time. And so that's what your homework is for next week. Now you could kind of view it two different ways. <clears throat> You could say that I want to track on two different colors, blue and yellow at the same time. I want to do that. Or what you could say is I want to track on red and straddle that zero. So one region you might say I want to, I want to include everything from zero to 10. And then I also want to include everything from 175 to 179. And that would be a nice slice of red. Does it make sense what I'm saying? And I will give you a hint. You can see that you're going to need a new hue range. It's like you're going to need hue low one, hue high one. You're going to need hue low two, hue high two. You're going to need two hue ranges. You don't need to have two ranges for uh, for sat and two ranges for val because really what you've got set on this one would work for the other one. So I'll make it a little easier that you're going to need to add two track bars, but then you're going to have to figure out how to put that into, how to fold that into the rest of your code so that you could track blue and you could track yellow at the same time if that makes sense. Okay, now let's go back to our mystery person from last week. Did any of you guys get this? I asked you to identify who this was and what sort of was something special about him. Okay, something special that he could sort of do that most people couldn't do. Okay, I'm making this lesson before I've seen your response to last week, so I'm not sure if anybody got this or not, but this is the most excellent King Haile Selassie, the king of Ethiopia. I think he was king of Ethiopia from about 1915 to about 1974. There was kind of a communist revolution in Ethiopia. He was disposed, deposed from power. And then unfortunately, some assassins uh, strangled him in his bed when he was old. But uh, Haile Selassie is really one of the really incredible people. I think they called him the Lion of Africa. And he was really a very, very noble king king. And one of the interesting things is, is that he could trace his genealogy all the way back to Adam and Eve, which is pretty amazing. And how does that happen? Well, the thing is that if you read in the Bible, 
the queen of Sheba, who was the queen of Ethiopia back in the days of Solomon, had heard of the magnificence and grandeur of Solomon. So the queen of Sheba went to Jerusalem to meet with uh, with King Solomon, and they kind of really hit it off and became very close. And as you sort of know, any woman that King Solomon was around, well, yeah, okay. So then from that point, the record sort of leaves the Bible, but then in Ethiopian history, what it was was that when uh, the Queen of Sheba was in Jerusalem visiting King Solomon, that they became together and she became impregnated and then came back to uh, to Ethiopia and she actually have a, had a child by King Solomon and then he became the king of Ethiopia and then you can easily trace that king of Ethiopia all the way down to Haile Selassie, which I think is just absolutely amazing. And then uh, there is just a lot of interesting history in Ethiopia. They also have like what Haile Selassie claimed is he claimed that the Ark of the Covenant, that the Ark of the Covenant was actually in Ethiopia and in Ethiopia to this day. And he had actually said that he had seen it. Now, when, if you research that, it's pretty clear that there is something very unusual in Ethiopia in this one uh, very special uh, very special church there and in fact they have the watcher like the watcher of the uh, the watcher of the Ark of the Covenant it's almost like an Indiana Jones type of thing and that guy like spends his life caring for the Ark and then he, he passes the torch to another person so generation after generation they have the, this guy there that is caring for the Ark now what like I just do a lot of research on this because I think it's fascinating what it seems is pretty clear there's something very very special object that exists in Ethiopia, but whether it is the actual Ark of the Covenant or maybe a very, very ancient reproduction, maybe when the Queen of Sheba came, maybe uh, maybe she brought the Ark with her or the Ark ended up down here, or maybe when she came, she remembered seeing it and then created a reproduction of it. But anyway, very interesting man, Holly Selassie, and I'll be very interesting to see if anybody won the person of mystery contest. So I'll have another mystery person contest for you, and that is for next week, who is this? This gentleman looking for the right first right answer. If you're in a premiere, don't answer it in the premiere chat box. Put it as a comment in uh, the comment section on this video. Okay, guys, I hope you are having as much fun taking these lessons as I am making these lessons. I think this was a big day that we were able to, for, to, to the for the first time track an object, and then in the next uh, in the next video, I'll show you the the, the solution to the homework uh, that I just gave you, which was to track two different colors at the same time, or to track red across the. Uh, across that uh, straddle, that zero region. All right, now what we're going to do is so far what you can see is we just got rid of everything except the object of interest. Then in the next lesson that I do after the homework solution, I'll say, how do we lock onto it? Like how do we box it so that mathematically OpenCV is tracking in math where an object is? Okay, and that is really getting into real object detection and object tracking but that will be the next lesson after the homework okay guys if you enjoyed this be sure to give us a thumbs up be sure if you haven't already to subscribe to the channel when you subscribe to the channel make sure you ring that bell so you get notifications of future lessons share this on your social media because we need the world needs more people coding and less people watching silly cat videos Paul McWhorter from TopTechBoy.com. I will talk to you guys later.